Thanks be to God. Most of us are probably aware that Albert Einstein was a physicist who pioneered the theory of relativity and came up with that famous equation, E equals MC squared. While I was in seminary in Princeton, New Jersey, Einstein's mythology took on a whole new dimension, so to speak, since the house where he spent his final years was right near the seminary campus. But when I read a biography of Einstein, it became clear to me that I didn't know a thing about him as a person. And it turns out this genius has quite a backstory. For one thing, he showed very few signs of genius as a child, even as a young adult. He graduated college near the bottom of his class, and it took him years to find a job at a university where he would actually get paid to teach and research and refine his ideas. He got married and then went through a bitter divorce after beginning an affair with his first cousin. He had a child out of wedlock whom he never even met. Most of us think of Einstein as the genius who transformed our understanding of space and time. But it turns out that Einstein was utterly human, as flawed as you and me. Something similar has happened, I think, with the main characters in the story we heard today. These magi have assumed a status of mythological proportions. Just think of all the details that have been added to this sparse account over the years, details extolled in hymns and art and children's picture books. Here are a few of the added details, none of which are found in Matthew's account, that most of us now take for granted, that there were three magi, that they were men, they were wise, they were kings, they rode camels. At the risk of rendering all of our nativity scenes, not to mention our Christmas pageant, inaccurate, the fact is none of these details are in the text. The text simply refers to magi, a Greek word from which we get our word magician, and it states that they came from the east and that the star they saw in the sky leads them not initially to an obscure stable in Bethlehem, but to Herod's palace in Jerusalem. They were looking for a king after all. From Jerusalem, Herod and his chief priests and scribes sent the Magi out to Bethlehem. Once they're back on the road, the star reappears in the sky and leads them to what must have been the most unlikely king they could have imagined. When they finally reach the end of their long and arduous journey, the Magi discover something unexpected and probably more than a little disturbing. It was not the royal family they had anticipated, but a poor newborn baby boy and his unremarkable peasant parents surrounded by animals in a dusty, stable. Einstein had an unusual way of coming up with his theories. He had an incredible imagination and an ability to conduct experiments purely in his mind, to imagine, for example, what it would be like to ride a motorbike alongside a beam of light, or to accelerate through deep space in a closed system like an elevator. Through these thought experiments, he would intuit certain principles and properties of space and time and light and matter. But often it took years for Einstein and his contemporaries to put mathematical formulas to his ideas. There were many times along the way that Einstein would go down paths that turned out to be total dead ends. Other times, he refused, at least at first, to follow the paths indicated by his experiments because they went in exactly the opposite direction he would have expected, based on centuries of accepted scientific principles. 
Einstein's discoveries ultimately required all of us to rethink many of these principles, including the foundations of Newtonian physics and Euclidean geometry. What made Einstein great was, in part, his willingness to unlearn everything he thought he knew. When the Magi first saw that star that heralded the birth of a new king, they thought they knew what they would find when they followed it. From their knowledge of astrology and prophecy, they determined that this star heralded the birth of a new king. So they assumed, as we do, that following it, they would be led to someone who fit their understanding of birth and kings. They couldn't have predicted that they'd be led to a backwater town, a crowded stable, and a manger serving as a cradle. Maybe this is why they showed up with gifts so completely inappropriate for a baby. Gold for royalty, frankincense for religious ceremonies, and myrrh, which was used to prepare bodies for burial. What kind of visitors brings a new baby gifts better suited to a funeral? Can you imagine showing up to your next baby shower with an urn? But whether they knew it or not, myrrh might just have been the most appropriate gift for a baby who was God incarnate, the divine in human flesh. For what is more human than death? What reveals more, the extraordinary nature of this divine birth than the fact that Jesus, as the hymn puts it, was born to die? But imagine Mary putting these gifts on Jesus' bookshelf so that he would see them every day of his childhood and his adolescence and even into his young adulthood. Could it be that these strange gifts served for Jesus as a kind of guide, like the star that guided the Magi? If so, how might these gifts, symbolizing royalty and divinity and death, how might they have reminded Jesus who he was and to whom he belonged? How might they have guided him on his journey from the manger to the cross? The poet T.S. Eliot is among those who have taken liberties in imagining and embellishing the story of the Magi. In his poem, The Journey of the Magi, he recounts the journey from the perspective of one of these Magi, who is now an old man, looking back on this experience that changed his life forever. It is not a pleasant recollection, for it was a difficult journey. A cold coming we had of it, just the worst time of the year for a journey, and such a long journey. The ways deep and the weather sharp, the very dead of winter, the night fires going out and the lack of shelters, and the cities hostile and the towns unfriendly and the villages dirty and charging high prices. A hard time we had of it. He then recalls finally arriving at a strange and unexpected place just in time to witness the birth. And in the rest of the poem, it becomes evident that the experience changed this man forever, so that once he got back home, things were never the same again. And as he looks back now, he wonders, was it a birth they saw, or was it a kind of death? He continues, all this was a long time ago, I remember, and I would do it again. But set down this, set down this. Were we led all that way for birth or death? There was a birth, certainly we had evidence and no doubt. I had seen birth and death, but had thought they were different. This birth was hard and bitter agony for us, like death, our death. We return to our places, these kingdoms, but no longer at ease here in the old dispensation with an alien people clutching their gods. 
Birth is always accompanied by a kind of death, just as true transformation always involves the end of something we thought we knew. Something must always die to make way for something new to be born. When we've experienced a birth of any kind, we cannot return to the places we came from without feeling that we no longer belong the way we once did. A couple of years ago on this Epiphany Sunday, the church I served gave out star words, these cardboard cutout stars with a word on each of them, a word that was meant to serve as a guide for the year ahead. That year, the word on my star was perseverance. I got that word two years in a row, so God was really trying to tell me something. I put it up on my desk and I saw it nearly every day. I had a pretty good idea of what that word meant when I got it, what it meant for me. But my year took some unexpected detours, as most years do. And along the way, the word took on a whole new meaning. It resonated in ways I could not have predicted. And eventually it became for me a sign, not so much of my perseverance, but of God's perseverance of God's persistent presence, of God's relentless capacity to be with us in all kinds of circumstances and through all kinds of challenges. Ultimately, it was a reminder that knowing the exact destination of our journey and what we expect to find there isn't the most important thing. What matters more is knowing and remembering along the way who we are, and to whom we belong. After Einstein's theory of general relativity was finally proven by measurements that could only be taken during a rare solar eclipse, the New York Times headline read, lights all askew in the heavens, men of science more or less agog over results of eclipse observations Stars not where they seemed or were calculated to be. But nobody need worry. Your life, your relationships, your journey of faith, for that matter, our whole broken world, chances are none of them are what they seemed or were calculated to be. The equations we thought would be reliable theoretical predictors have a tendency to break down when we put them into practice. What we thought was a birth might contain a kernel of death and what looked just like death might hold a seed of new life. But nobody need worry. For the child whose birth is at the heart of this story, the child whose birth and death are at the hearts of all our stories, this child both guides us and journeys with us. We are guided by our loving God who will stop at nothing to reveal God's love and care and who uses the most unlikely elements of our lives to lead us on this journey. It's a journey of transformation and discovery and unexpected surprises. A journey on which we just might learn that death is not the worst thing and that love, the most persistent and the most powerful force in all of God's universe, love, is the word that guides us all. Amen.